On the docket tonight is the deadly road rage shooting trial. Defendant Theodore Edgecombe is set to stand trial for the shooting death of an immigration attorney. Court TV's uh, Chanley Painter has the details. We hope everyone continues to, uh, you know, keep a open mind and not try the case in the media and just wait till the facts uh, come about. The case involves Theodore Edgecombe, accused of murder in the shooting death of immigration attorney Jason Clearman. Police claim it started out as a verbal altercation while Edgecombe was riding his bicycle in Milwaukee last year, and it ended with Edgecombe shooting and killing Clearman. Prosecutors say Edgecombe provoked the attack. This is a census act. There's no reason for it. But defense attorneys say Edgecombe was the victim and pointed to this surveillance video showing Clearman following Edgecombe, then getting out of his car and approaching the cyclist moments before Edgecombe fires. This is a clear case of self-defense, and we look forward to and maintain confidence in our judicial system uh, to establish the same. The case has drawn comparisons to Kyle Rittenhouse, who claimed at his trial he was defending himself when he shot and killed two men and injured a third during protest in the neighboring city of Kenosha last year. He lunges at me with his pistol pointed directly at my head. The defense team plans to call John Black, the same expert whose testimony helped acquit Rittenhouse. I have a known distance and I have a Time that it took him to run that known distance. Theodore Edgecombe deserves the same right that Kyle Rittenhouse got. But Clearman's widow, a witness to the shooting, says Edgecombe was the only one armed and violent that night. My husband got up because he wanted to just talk to the man, and the guy waited. I was just standing, just standing there waiting. And that's my husband got real close. I saw him pull out a gun, and my husband never saw it because he was close and shot him point blank in the head. And I saw my husband drop to the gun. At the time of the shooting, Edgecombe was out on bond, and as a condition of his release, he was not allowed to have a gun. He was arrested about six months later in Kentucky. The defense is fighting to limit what the jury should hear about his other case and argues it shouldn't have any bearing on Edgecombe's right to defend himself. The state's attempt here is to bootstrap this bail jumping charge to prejudice the jury by confusing them to try to continue a narrative that somehow Mr. Edgecombe would not be privileged to exercise self-defense because he would perhaps have an order that would deny him the right to have a firearm in the first place. Edgecombe is facing two counts of bail jumping in addition to first degree intentional homicide. He is being held on a $250,000 cash bond. Let me bring in our think tank for some discussions. Still with us, former senior homicide prosecutor Bernardo Villalona, criminal defense attorney Ian Friedman, and criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Brian Watkins. Great to have you all tonight on the show. Ian Friedman, I'd like to start with you on this one, if I may, please. Just give us your overall assessment of this case going in. Does either side have any advantage or disadvantage that you're seeing, please? Yeah, I mean, it's clearly going to be a self-defense. Uh, you know, did the defendant reasonably fear for uh, his safety at the moment? Uh, the state's going to claim that he brought the uh, conflict uh, to himself when he pulled up and hit the uh, passenger, now deceased, uh, that he shouldn't have had a gun. They're going to bring up all this stuff about how he fled afterwards and all the stuff that it's going to, you know, they want the jury not to like him. At the end of the day, this is going to come down to the lawyering. Uh, and, you know, the, the lawyers have to do a very good job from the moment they start the jury selection to uh, obligating that jury to really look at the moment that it occurred, the moment that the deceased approached the defendant, uh, did he reasonably fear for his safety? I hear the wife saying, you know, he didn't know he was the only one with a gun and so forth. But I've said this many times. Self-defense, utilizing self-defense is to preserve your safety. Do you need to wait until you're hurt? Now, I the facts that I like, actually, or that I would really utilize as defense counsel is the fact that, yeah, it's going to come in that the defendant hit him. But as he keeps going, then, now all of a sudden he's got to look back 
there's a car coming to his left. Who knows what's in the car or what the driver's going to do. And you've got the person behind him who was just hit, now getting out and walking to him, not knowing what he's going to do or whether he has a gun. If you put the jury in the mind of that person at that moment, have them place themselves not in the jury box any longer, but on that piece of the sidewalk holding the bike, and now all of a sudden realizing, oh, gee, wait a second, I probably would be scared too. There really is a viable self-defense claim here. So it's going to be interesting. The comparison here between what happened in Kenosha and what happened in this particular case, I think is going to come down to the lawyering. Yes, well said. This is a tricky case. Um, we know uh, tricky ones like this are the ones that often wind up at trial. Brian Watkins, let's talk a little bit about what I think this jury is probably going to be hearing a lot about uh, provocation. Uh, here we know that this man who's on trial was pursued by the man who's dead, but we know that Theodore Edgecombe also reached into the car and punched the man who is now dead before that man got out of the car and pursued him. When it comes to using self-defense, we know you can't provoke an attack and then use it. Um, tell me how you assess that uh, legal issue as it may apply to this case, please, Brian. You know, that's a good, that's a really good question. The problem here is that fact that the defendant actually punched the victim in this case cuts both ways because now the defendant can say, well, I punched him, so I have reason to believe he's out to harm me. I have reason to believe he's going to do something to me, A, because he has reason to, and that bolsters the defendant's credibility as to whether or not he was in reasonable fear for his safety. But here's where the defense is going to fall apart. You can't use a gun in a fist fight. The defendant started a fist fight by getting physical. I understand that there was words exchanged both ways. And now he's defending himself against retaliation from that punch with a gun. And therefore, you can't use a gun in a fist fight. The question is not whether or not I was scared that this guy was going to do something to me. It can't be something. It has to be that the, that the victim was going to cause me great bodily injury or death. That's when you can use deadly force. So we're talking about the use of force here. We have to also remember that it's the use of deadly force. If the defendant here simply punched the individual or pushed him or did something like that, it would still be an assault charge and he'd have a great self-defense case. The question now is, was deadly force reasonable? Did Could he use deadly force? And I don't know what the victim did to basically make the use of deadly force, a gun, justifiable. A fist fight is a fist fight. You can't use a gun in one of those. Really good point, Brian. Bernarda, tell me, as these prosecutors are thinking about Tuesday, when the jury selection is set to start, surely they're thinking about all the witnesses they're calling, they're prepping their case. This guy is most likely going to take the stand. We know his attorneys indicated that to the court previously. We know he's saying he acted in self-defense. They've got that burden of production, not burden of proof, just burden of production for that affirmative defense. Tell me what you'd be doing if you were one of the prosecutors for the state in prepping to cross-examine Theodore Edgecombe. Exactly. So the prosecutor is going to have to be ready to cross-examine this defendant and also know how they're going to cross-examine the defendant. Not when he's about to take the stand, but you need to be prepared from the time of jury selection. Because from jury selection, you're going to start putting your theory, your narrative out to the jury so it can play along during the entire trial. So by the time you do the, the closing arguments, you have now disproved self-defense. Because what happens is that when a defendant puts forth the self-defense as justification for the homicide, as a prosecutor, you don't bring additional evidence. What you do is that you use the exact evidence that you entered into evidence to dispute the self-defense. And you use the defendant's testimony as well to discredit that defendant that he did not fear reasonable, there wasn't no reasonable fear of imminent deadly force that was going to be applied towards them. Excellent points you all made tonight. This is going to be a really fascinating case to see unfold. And just a reminder again, the jury selection on this one starts on Tuesday. Court TV cameras will be inside that courtroom for this trial. We're going to bring it to you gavel to gavel starting January 18th. Time for a short